backing up because I went to go save the video of the first part of this lecture and realized that I had forgotten to actually press the record button. So I've just been talking to myself for 15 minutes, which doesn't make me happy. Um, but that's not your fault, so I'm going to be cheerful. So today's lecture for MSE 6765 is a review of some basic dislocation theory. For those of you in material science, you know, hold on, I'm just going to make sure I'm recording real fast. Yes, I am. For those of you uh, in materials, this is going to be completely a review. You've seen this in your undergrad. You've seen it in structures and defects uh, here in the department. For those of you from ISC and MAE, a lot of this might be new. And so uh, uh, the pages have turned. This is old hat to your material science friends, much in the same way that the continuum mechanics was very familiar to you um, and not so much to the, the materials folks. So if you're confused, if you feel lost, find a MSE student and uh, uh, make a friend. So just the definitional thing, the resolved shear stress, we probably all remember this. Um, but it was observed that deformation in single crystals occurs by shearing on certain crystallographic planes or slip planes, right? If we, if we pull on a single crystal, I'm pointing with my finger and you're not going to be able to see that. If we pull on a single crystal in tension, we get this stepped interfaces parallel lines that appear uh, along a certain certain direction. And we now know that this shear is caused by the motion of line defects or dislocations which move on specified slip systems. Before dislocation theory, it was just thought that this whole plane of atoms sheared simultaneously. Um, but if we think about a defect moving on this plane, we need to know what is the shear, what is the force acting on that dislocation. So we introduced this concept called the resolved shear stress. And that is the stress projected onto the slip plane, right? So that gives us a traction vector. And then we project that traction vector along the slip direction. And that gives us a scalar force. It's the dot product of the traction vector with the slip direction. Or the double dot product of the slip direction, the slip, the plane normal in the slip direction of the stress tensor. Right? And so if we imagine two angles, phi, which is the angle between the tensile loading axis and our slip plane normal and lambda which is the angle between our loading tensile axis and our slip direction we can define the resolved shear stress in this way or this is the the scalar stress that that, that component of the stress tensor uh, in the direction but it's better just to think about it in terms of the physical interpretation it's the projection it's the traction on the slip plane projected in the slip direction so the dislocation theory was developed long before there was any real proof of dislocations i mean putting air quotes around proof um, the dislocation theory was developed in the 20s and 30s uh, to a fairly sophisticated level, and the real conclusive proof for the presence of dislocations was the invention of the transmission electron micrograph, a microscope, when we actually saw pictures for the first time of these line defects in crystals, and you could see people actually saw dislocations. Mm -hmm. Physical metallurgy textbooks, oops, I dropped something. Physical metallurgy textbooks up into the 1950s often presented evidence for and against the dislocation theory. But the dislocation theory 
came about because there was a huge discrepancy between the calculations of how strong a, a crystal should be versus the experimental observations. So I'm not going to go through the derivation. Most of you have seen it before. It's in the reading. Um, but if we assume we have two planes of crystals, or two a crystal, and we have two planes of atoms, and we want to shear this plane relative to this one through the application of a shear stress, what we see is that we have to make this atom climb over this one to move into this A, from to go from the A position to the B position. So we can model this stress as a sinusoid. And if we assume that this whole plane shears simultaneously, we're going to simultaneously distort all of the bonds across the plane and reform new bonds. And we can end up with a uh, estimate for the shear strength of the, the crystal as basically g, the shear modulus, by 2 pi. There's other approximations. Depending on what sort of assumptions you make, you can get anywhere from roughly the shear modulus to about g by 20. But it's all roughly in this order of magnitude, g by 2 pi. Right, And this estimate was first done by Frank in 1926. The problem was when we compare this to reality, for example, silver has a theoretical yield strength of 4.6 GPA, but a well annealed single crystal of silver had experimentally measured yield strengths of less than a megapascal, or roughly a, a factor of 10,000 difference between the predicted strength and the uh, and the observed, right? So anywhere between 500 and uh, 10,000, right, is the, was the discrepancy. So there's a couple things that could explain that. Either the basis of, the, or the entire understanding of the bonding and the bond strength of metals was wrong, or that the crystal was not shearing the entire plane simultaneously. And since the, the theory of atomic bonding, um, while the full quantum theory was not really into effect, people understood that there was a... Uh, um, had models of uh, the atomic structure of metals that, that did a very good job of, pre of predicting um, things like bond strengths. So another piece of evidence that came up about the same time, people made really, really thin whiskers. We would call them kind of nanowires today. But... And when these whiskers were really well annealed, their, theor their experimental strengths approach their theoretical strengths. So this led people to speculate that there's some kind of defect in the crystal that is allowing a, that is somehow facilitating the easy yielding or the easy plastic flow of these crystals. Now here's the picture I took right out of Callister. This is probably the book you used in your introduction to material science undergrad. But the conclusion that was drawn is that slip does not occur simultaneously everywhere across the plane. Instead, we have these line defects in our crystal. We're going to call them dislocations that facilitate shear by allowing a very limited number of bonds to be distorted at a time as they move across the crystal. And as they pass, if they pass out of the crystal completely, they'll leave behind a perfect undefected state. So dislocations are really, from a, a more macroscopic point of view, 
we can think of them as lines that separate the slipped area or the sheared area of a crystallographic plane from the unslipped or unsheared area of the plane. And as a, a final note, if you haven't watched this recently, and by recently I mean in the last year or so, uh, take a look at the uh, a film from 1954, Experiments with the Bubble Model of Metal Structure. It's only about 15 minutes long, but look at the names of the people who developed it. Sir, Sir Lawrence Bragg, right? the guy who invented X-ray diffraction. Right? Lomer, the Lomer Cottrell Lock, um, J.F. Nye, right? The Nye. Um, in dislocation theory, we have something called the Nye tensor in continuum mechanics, which describes the dislocation content uh, in the structure. He wrote a book, The Tensor Properties of, of Crystals. Um, so watch it now. This is an absolutely fascinating video. And it really describes the state of uh, um, evidence for dislocations before observing them in the TEM. Some experiments of different mo of this the bubble raft model uh, and how it can explain the uh, the easy yielding. So take a look, um, give it a watch, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it.